What a week. I started flying to Sydney on Saturday. On Sunday, I facilitated a workshop. On Monday, I participated in the workshop. On Tuesday, I went to see Simon Sinek. On Wednesday, I had a load of my customers come together to learn from each other. On, th on Wednesday night, I flew to Melbourne. On Thursday, I facilitated a workshop in Melbourne. And then on Friday, I ran another workshop, a second workshop in Melbourne. And then Friday night, I flew home. That was a big week. And it was awesome, I loved it. The most annoying thing is when someone sends you an invite to a meeting that you've never spoken to them about before. Why do people do that? I haven't spoken to you about this. We've barely spoken in the last two months. If you want to have a meeting with someone, ring them up or even send an email. Ring them up and say, hi, I'd like to have a meeting with you to talk about one, two, three, four. And then we agree to have a meeting and then we meet. When someone sends through a blank email calendar invite and it just says, this date, at this time, we're going to meet with no reference, I'm just going to always, always ignore it. Like, what does this mean? I haven't agreed to this. That's my rent. Thank you very much. Last week, I'm in Sydney, went to see Simon Sinek, who is the author of Start With Why. He's recently had a video on millennials, but that's been extremely popular. I had a client who bought me this book, fantastic book. He signed it on the inside. It's kind of the thing that authors do. And when he was signing it, the they've got people who take your photo, and they took my photo. They took like 15 or 20 photos. And one of them, one of the photos, I was kind of recoiling a bit and I was looking a bit, I, I laughed, but it was just one of those photos that most people would delete. But instead, I thought, if you're not making fun of yourself, what's the point? So I posted onto social media and had a, well, uh, a quite a large response had a lot of people who commented on it think it was silly the caption of course that I put was meeting Simon Sinek trying not to look like a teenage groupie but if you're not making fun of yourself what's the point that's the thing it, 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 it was funny rather than I thought I can delete it or I can share it and I share it that's okay Part of the Simon Sinek presentation was he, one of his people running a workshop and it was, it was pretty challenging. He was trying to run a workshop with two and a half thousand people, which I don't know, it's, it's tough. In any case, his name was Peter Docker and he had outlined why purpose is important around four drugs he calls the EDSOs, which is endorphin, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin. These four key chemicals in the brain that stimulate certain behaviors. Let's have a look at what each of these mean. The first one is endorphins. So endorphins are stimulated through physical exercise and that's why after a run, you'll get a run as high, but also endorphins will mask pain. So when you get the run as high and you have sore legs, you won't feel those sore legs until after such time as the endorphins reduce. And then you'll say, oh, my legs are so sore after running. So endorphins are the first. Second is dopamine. So dopamine, is released when we accomplish something. And so if we set metrics or KPIs 
and we achieve those, we get a tiny little shot of dopamine and it's very addictive. And so dopamine gets us to accomplish more. That's why dopamine and endorphins together uh, work really well in sports. Serotonin will reinforce relationships when recognition is provided in a public forum or in a public manner. So we can release serotonin uh, and help people to feel more pride and more status in front of peers. Fourth is oxytocin. So oxytocin is about interpersonal relationships and it's released around interpersonal relationships. When we interact with people who we like, there's tiny little shots of oxytocin that are released. When someone walks up to you and touches your arm and says, hi, how are you going? That's another little shot of oxytocin. So oxytocin helps us to feel like we're, we're amongst people that we care about, that, are, that we're trusted. And oxytocin will enable people to give discretionary effort. And so the point is, when we're using purpose, there is a science and, and a chemical reason, a real fundamental chemical reason, behind what we're trying to do and what we're trying to achieve. Here's a couple of phrases I liked from Simon Sinek. The first is, leadership has nothing to do with being in charge, but everything to do with the safety of those who are within your charge. Leaders must sacrifice their own interest for the interests of others. Great leaders practice empathy. Be the leader that you wish you had. And one of my favorites is play the infinite game, the long game, not the finite game. And Simon gave several examples of companies who are playing the finite game rather than the long game. One in particular was the Vietnam War. So the US went to Vietnam to try to win uh, the war whereas the Vietnamese were playing the long game, the infinite game. They were trying to effectively save their country rather than just go in and win a war and, and leave. And then he used the example in business where if you're trying to play the finite game, the short game, you're gonna lose every time. Everything should be coming back to what are you doing in the longer term rather than the finite term, the short term. For example, listed companies who are really focused on this quarter's results and nothing else will uh, create great damage within their culture to achieve those results at the expense of the long-term strategy or culture of the organization. And here's the one I think I like the most. It talks about the need for trust and human interaction and why we can't let that slip out of workplaces. We, we need to have a trusting and purpose-driven environment. So in business, you would do a handshake deal without a contract. In other words, contract being a written document which outlines what each party would do. And you would do a handshake deal to execute based on trust between two people, but you would never do a contract without a handshake. In other words, you would never write a contract unless you knew the other party and you trusted the other party, at least to a degree, and you were able to really shake their hand and get that sense of trust. I really like that. I want to talk about a phrase that is used as a bit of a trump card by some people and I just don't I, I just don't subscribe to it so the phrase is culture eats strategy for breakfast and it was originally attributed to Peter Drucker and it's arguable even if he actually said it but what they're really saying is culture is far more important than strategy now, it might be said by some people that I'm a strategy guy and therefore, logically, I'm going to defend strategy, but I'm not. 
because there are other people who say, well, I'm a culture guy, so I would defend culture. If we break down a business to its most raw form, it is people doing stuff. That's it. People doing stuff. So getting people to do the right stuff that adds the most value is strategy. Getting people to do stuff in a way that they operate with each other in the best manner, that's culture. So these are the two definitions that I would use. So first of all, strategy. Strategy is a unique and valuable position involving a different set of activities from competitors. That comes from Michael Porter. A unique and valuable position involving a different set of activities from competitors. And so what that means is you're doing something that is different to your competitors that gives you a unique and valuable position in the market and therefore you're capturing your own value. You're, you're, you're valuable. People will pay you more money because of the things that you're doing that are unique and different that ideally meet the customer's needs. Let's now look at the definition of culture. Culture is about the beliefs and behaviours that determine how a company's employees and management interact. Now, that definition could be argued. So I just don't think that culture eats strategy for breakfast. I think it's, it's like saying food and water, which is more important. If, if a company is just people doing stuff, you've got to get people to be able to work together into relationship wise and with management and with customers. You've got to get that all to work really, really well. And then you've got to be got to get them to be doing the stuff that matters, the stuff that creates a valuable and unique position. So I think it's it's completely ridiculous to try to say that one is more important than the other. Strategy is really important and culture is really important. Have are the great companies that have both a great strategy and a great culture, they will win hands down every time. The companies that only have a great strategy and a terrible culture, and at the moment I'm thinking in particular about Uber and Uber's cultural problems at their, their head office and the challenges and the culture, the bullying, and a lot of the things that I've kind of read about there. Great strategy, not a great culture. What if Kodak had an amazing culture, yet their strategy was clearly beaten hands down. I think you've got to have a balance of both. You can't just say, we will pick this because it's, it helps you to, to validate your perspective on the world.